In this video, we're going to talk about social media and polarization. We've talked about polarization in previous videos. Essentially, we're talking about things getting further apart. And we find that through the parties or the voters themselves. We can observe different trends of polarization. We can see this in research by Shanto Iyengar and out party thermometer ratings, so how people feel on a scale of 1 to 100 about their political opponents. We can also see that same sentiment mapped onto ratings of the out party presidential candidate and organizations like VDEM have their own metrics of polarization. And across all of those, they are increasing. We do find evidence that polarization is increasing. But what is the role of social media in that? We think of social media tools like Facebook and Twitter. They are tools for connectivity. They bring people together. They allow us to communicate seamlessly and share information but they also might be drivers of polarization. And this is documented in research by Jamie Settle in her book, Frenemies. What Settle argues is that social media platforms have certain characteristics. These are called affordances. These are features of the sites that might actually increase polarization. So when you think of the things you can do on sites like Facebook in, in her focus, Profile management. You can curate your online identity. You can broadcast your likes, desires, and preferences to the world. You can cultivate your online persona. Content creation. You can write about how you feel. You can share those, those thoughts. And then interaction. You can like and you can share other people's um, content. Now, in this, the, the affordances in these tools like Facebook or Twitter are not explicitly political. It's not really what they're for, but that's what they do. And you might be exposed to this through what um, Settle calls her end framework, through witnessing expression, news, and discussion. You might not be on Facebook for political content, but you will be exposed to it through people expressing themselves, different news content and coverage, and then discussions about the news. You will get exposed to this just through your presence on the platform. The big affordance that drives this is Facebook's news feed. This is passive content consumption. This is Facebook showing you things that it suspects you will find interesting. And it just shows up. It just keeps showing up and it keeps populating. And eventually what will happen is you will, as you consume the newsfeed, you, different social issues might, might um, prop up, something like police violence. And you will notice different people in the newsfeed taking different stances around these issues. Um, maybe there's a controversy or a particular current event and we see people coalesce onto different sides and broadcasting their thoughts about this. Now, we also see what people happen to link, share, and like, and that's a good indicator for Facebook of popularity. Um, what it likes to do is content that gets a lot of interactions, so a lot of shares or likes, will be prioritized by the news feed. So it will show you things that other people like and share a lot, presuming that you want to see that content too. And so that algorithmic amplification ensures that high engagement material will flow to the top of the newsfeed and get prioritized for people. And how does that play it? Well, over time, as you see your newsfeed, as you see different people liking and sharing different things, you'll start to be able to identify different factions and different groups out there in your social media network. We know from social identity theory that this has a natural polarizing consequence. Social identity theory suggests that people's self-esteem is linked to their group membership and the prestige of that group. They want their group to win interactions against outgroups. And once we make an identity salient, whether it is around a social issue or political preference, it, comes, it becomes important to people. They feel an attachment to it and they want to make differential inferences about their group versus the outgroup. They want their group to be better than the outgroup, and that can fuel polarization. Also from the realm of economics, something called signaling theory, that the things people do are intended as signals to others. And we can think about this again through a presence on social media. What you're doing online is you're signaling to members of your team, your in-group, that you are on their side. Maybe you're attacking somebody, uh, a politician or, or, a, or a political figure, and in that sense, it becomes a performative exercise. Politics becomes performative. You are performing for members of your in-group, trying to generate um, likes and attention and prestige from them 
by demonizing the outgroup. This will ultimately incentivize more extreme behavior online. You heard the term virtue signaling, a lot of people trying to signal their um, virtuous behaviors. The inverse is also true. There's vice signaling, people that try and signal norm-breaking behavior um, to their network. So how does that play out in the news feed? Well, where algorithmic amplification pushes things to the top that are controversial, that are likely to drive engagement, we are going to see more extreme content. The content that Facebook thinks we want is the high engagement stuff that will naturally be more extreme. The normal, whatever, whatever that is, um, content is deprioritized and de-emphasized by the news feed. We can look at these tools, revisit these graphs, and figure out when Facebook um, uses, starts using algorithmic implement, excuse me, algorithmic amplification for their newsfeed in 2006. They also introduced the like button in 2009, and Twitter introduces the retweet button. So in that time, when we sort of revisit these graphs, thinking about those platform affordances. Um, we kind of see some, some overlap there. Around the time of these features being introduced, we see these graphs um, really start to pivot. And so just to recap, it's possible that the features, the affordances of social media platforms are driving polarization. They are encouraging extreme behavior online. They are encouraging people to signal to their group and antagonize an outgroup. And other people that may not even want to get involved in politics are being exposed to this content through algorithmic amplification. Now, this will ultimately incentivize extreme behavior, extreme position taking to try and drive engagement. And that could be fueling polarization.